Hello, welcome back to Oral Surgery Journal Club. Today we have a very interesting classic paper to discuss. This paper is from William Proffitt and Tim Turvey, and it concerns the hierarchy of stability and predictability when it comes to various orthognathic surgical movements. Now this is a landmark paper, and it's quite frequently referenced, and I think it's important for everyone to be familiar with. And then at the very end, we'll talk about maybe uh, does it still apply today? So William Prophet is an orthodontist and Tim Turvey is an oral surgeon and together they amassed quite a volume of orthodontic patients. Data, their database started back in 1975 and this goes all the way until the time of this publication which is 2007. And over that time they had over 2,000 orthodontic patients. I should mention that this is actually the second study published by these authors. So this is like the updated version. They first published in 1996 and then this is the more updated version in 2007. I kind of wish that they did another one maybe in 2017 but unfortunately they, this is as far as they their publications go. Anyway so again a very classic landmark paper worth knowing um, and so they had impressively 2,000 orthognathic patients. Uh, they did a good job not just operating on so many patients but also following up with them. So 1,500 out of those patients had at least one year of follow-up and 500 of them had five years follow-up. And what they were able to do is they were able to overlay the lateral cefts and they were able to look for the degree of relapse. And based on the degree of relapse for their 2,000 patients, they were able to come up with a hierarchy of stability and say the following procedures are considered stable and they have very little relapse and are very highly predictable versus the following procedures are not considered very stable and they are problematic or worrisome. And let's take a look at their pyramid. This is what's very frequently referenced. So this is their hierarchy of stability. And starting at the top, that is considered very stable, and then getting to the bottom, that's where you get to the, the area of problematic procedures or problematic movements. We're going to be going through this in turn one at a time, but just to be familiar with the overall picture, let's go through it quickly. So very stable is maxilla up and mandible forward. Then still stable is maxilla forward. And then still stable, but qualified stable only with rigid fixation and again this is for 2007 nowadays that's kind of standard of course we only do things with rigid fixation compared to maybe wires and maybe some of the earlier ways of treating orthognathic patients but in this category of these are still stable pr provided that they're used with rigid fixation would be combination two draw surgeries so maxilla up mandible forward meaning how we would treat a class 2 patient and as well as maxilla forward mandible back how we would treat a class 3 patient. Both of those were considered stable. And then finally, this fourth category of problematic, these were very unstable, these at a high rate of relapse. They were isolated mandible back. So notice, when you did a two-jaw mandible back, it was actually fairly stable. But when you do an isolated mandible back, they saw that they had a higher degree of relapse. And then maxilla down and maxilla wider, those were also considered problematic and had a higher degree of relapse. So let's go through it. Um, a little bit. So again, let's go through it one at a time. In the, in the highly stable category, you have things as, such as maxilla up and mandible forward. Now let's just take that at a time and understand it. So maxilla up, as you probably would have guessed, is very stable because when you're reducing maxilla, you're going to have direct bone to bone contact versus if you're going to do maxilla down, well then it's it's not necessarily going to have bone to bone contact and it may be essentially swinging or hanging free. And that to that degree it creates a little bit of relapse and mandible forward that has to do with just the the muscular attachments and the different stresses on the bone post-surgery um, and then finally also I should mention chin was also in that category chin in any direction up down left right removal of a wedge chin in any position was considered to be very stable um, all right, so that was highly stable. Then the other categories of stable and stable only with rigid fixation, those were both class two and both class three. So maxilla up, mandible forward, like how you would treat a class two, that was in this category. And again, class three, so maxilla forward, mandible back, both of them and some asymmetry, both of the asymmetry, all those were considered stable provided with rigid fixation. Um, they said in th those categories, they had about 90% of those patients had excellent results when they used rigid fixation, but if they did not use rigid fixation, then their results only 60% had good results and 40% had relapse. So for this category, the rigid fixation was key. And then finally, that 
fourth uh, the fourth category, the problematic category, were things like we talked about widening of the maxilla and downward movement of the maxilla. And that kind of makes sense, like I was saying before, because you're not getting direct bone to bone contact. And we also know widening, when, when we talked about before with a SARPI, we know that both of those procedures are considered uh, high rates of relapse. But I do think it's interesting that an isolated mandibular step back had such a, such a degree of relapse. I found that interesting and I wasn't quite familiar with that. Let's look at some of the pictures and then we'll get into this last part. So maxill up, like we said, that was highly stable. And if you look at this composite tracing, 40 patients, so the yellow and the blue, they're nearly overlapped, which means there was almost no relapse. So that's maxilla up. We knew that was a very stable one. The other one that was very stable was mandible forward. And same picture. This composite, composite tracing shows almost no change from the surgery and one year later. Basically perfectly overlaying on top of each other. Now let's compare those pictures to maxilla wider. So that's one of the problematic ones. The maxilla wider, we're talking about a segmental maxilla. Like, um, and this is related to a SARPI. We do expect a certain amount of relapse when it comes to widening of the maxilla. And so if you look at, in this graph, um, the yellow is in between the first, pre, first molars and the blue is between the first premolars. So, but let's look at between the first molars. About 50% of patients had between a one and three millimeters. So let's, between one and three, let's make it easy. Let's just say, two millimeters. So about 50% of patients had two millimeters of relapse and 30% of patients had greater than three millimeters of relapse. So that's fairly significant. Um, so we know maxilla wider, not very stable. And then I just want to mention mandibular, isolated mandibular setback. So they found that was also not very stable. And I found that interesting, almost surprising because I would have imagined mandibular back would be equally stable or, or maybe even more stable than mandible forward. But why was it not? So based on their study, they think it has to do with the changing of the gonial angle. That often when you're setting back the mandible, you're changing this inclination of this gonial angle and then due to the muscular strain over time, it wants to go back to this norm, more passive position. And as it goes, so as it goes more into this passive position, look at one year later is the purple. So you see blue is immediate after surgery. And then a year later, it starts to find its passive position more forward. And by that, you'll see even the chin comes forward, although not, not a tremendous amount. So let's look at, at the chin specifically. So pre-surgery is yellow. It drops back to blue, and then a year later, it comes forward. So you have a certain degree of relapse. Obviously not complete relapse, or else no one would do the surgery, but you do find this amount of relapse, which is a fair bit of relapse when it came to mandibular back. So that's the data, and that's the hierarchy from this Profit and Turvey paper, and I think it's really important to know. Um, one more caveat of this paper. So everything I taught until now, I was just talking about one year composite tracings, but then they also did five year, and that was also gave us some other interesting results. They found there was a different pattern of stability when it came to long term analysis, and at that point, you're not looking at necessarily post surgical change because it's healed. You're looking at compensatory growth, and I found that fascinating. So they found um, when it came to mandibular length, so patients who were class two, and they had we lengthened their mandible. Over time, they saw a fair bit of them, their mandibular length was decreased. And it was surprising because that happened between, more than, it happened between one and five years. It did not happen immediately. So there was a certain amount of, of mandibular length that was lost a year or two after the surgery. So let me read this to you. In about 20% of the patients who had mandibular advancement, mandibular length decreases between one and five years post-treatment. They found that for also they found that for all the movements that there was a certain amount of relapse that occurred far down the road, and that certainly wasn't because of the the inherent stability of the surgery, but it had to do with just compensatory growth or or continued growing or adaptive growth that would have caused this amount of relapse. And then one last point, a caveat within this caveat, that even though they found this this long term late relapse, they said it didn't really affect the teeth as much because of compensation. So they said about most of the patients who had 
they, they, we advanced their mandible and then they lost that mandible. So the data suggests, let me read it, I'll, they'll say it better than I'm about to skew it. The data suggests that long after the surgical healing is complete, remodeling of the condyles decreases the mandibular length and the ramus height in about 25% of the patients. So about a quarter of the patients are having this. But they did not get an increase in overjet. So an increase in overjet occurred in only about half of those patients because of dental adaptation and proclination of the lower incisors. So long after the surgery was done, so we advanced, we lengthened the mandible. Long after, five years later, we'll take a CEF and we'll see the mandible is shorter, but that didn't cause an overjet because of the teeth proclined. And the same thing was found when it came to maxilla too. So they said for patients with open bite, where we brought the maxilla down, which we know is not a very stable movement, over time, they saw there was amount of relapse of that, and, and the maxilla went back to its passive position in a higher position. But you did not see a greater degree of overlap, and they think it's also for that same reason, because of co a compensatory super eruption of the teeth to help close the gap. So they did not find a, a dental relapse, a late long-term dental relapse, even though they did find a, de a late long-term skeletal relapse. Um, all right, now I wanna, so this is the hierarchy, and I think it's important to know, but the, the question I have, which I'm sure you're all thinking is, how much of it do we have to take into account into today's day and age when we're doing orthognathic surgery? Does it still apply? And in, profit, in, in this profit article, they, they hint to it, and I'm gonna conclude with maybe a more current study to help offset some of this data. But some of the, the, the what they basically say is, some of the, the more problematic procedures, which were mandibular back, maxilla down, maxilla wider, we have figured out ways of overcoming and making those more stable. So when it comes to mandibular back, he thinks it has to do with the, the, the angle of the ramus. And that could, that just a surgical technique in controlling where we make sure that we're, we're seating the condyle in the most posterior position. But we shouldn't, we should be attempting to not change the inclination of the ramus itself. We should be putting the ramus in the pre surgical position if possible. Um, and then when it comes to maxilla down, we have different ways of trying to overcome those and make them more predictable. And that includes using heavier rigid fixation using bone grafts or hydroxyapatite bone grafts and also if you do double draw surgery that also helps kind of indirectly because when you do a double saw surgery the bite post-surgically tends to be a lot softer so be between those things using heavier fixation bone grafting and doing a double draw surgery we were able to overcome that and then finally when it comes to widening of the maxilla he basically says well there is a lot of relapse of that but doing a SARPI first versus doing a segmental effort has not been shown to be very effective. So basically the, the relapse is just an acceptable loss. There's, we don't have a way to counter that. All right, so that's it for the William Prophet and uh, Tim Turvey paper. And then I wanted to look at, you know, it's been 15 years since that paper's come around. Has there been anyone else who came and looked at it and, and maybe updated that hierarchy? And Yes, I found a great paper. This comes in 2019. It's a meta-analysis from a bunch of Spanish surgeons, and they did a fantastic job, very detailed, as you can see from all the pages I'm skipping through. And they came out with, to my delight, a new, very a new hierarchy pyramid based on stability. And the green is considered highly stable. And in their new, in their new hierarchy, you'll see the mandibular setback has been resolved. And so basically what I was, even what Prophet was assuming in 2007 that with just different technique we could overcome that, that's been found to be true. So basically all the movements, be, and, and they're very specific. So I'm gonna read through this briefly. Uh, BSSO for clockwise rotation, BSSO for mandibular advancement, BSSO for mandibular setback. All of them are considered highly stable as long as you're using titanium rigid uh, fixation. Uh, where you get less and less stable is when you're using resorbable fixation. And then finally, let's look at the very top of their pyramid. So this is even modern days. Which, are the, which procedures even nowadays are considered still, at this point, still unstable? So most of the ones in this two top two tiers would be segmental effort, segmental effort, segmental effort. So we know that hasn't been overcome. That, and that's understandable to some degree, and we account for that to some degree. And we try to overexpand when we do segmental efforts or BS, or uh, Sarpies. Um, 
A couple of other things in, in this category would be resorbable, rigid, resorbable fixation. And that's not surprising. I don't even know why you would do resorbable fixation. Where we train, that's not common. Maybe in Europe, maybe people are doing more resorbable. People are concerned about titanium. But I mean, I wouldn't even think to use resorbable plates. And finally, the BSSO was in this unstable category with, with the one caveat when it was bicorticals bi like lag screws, which is, again, we could talk about that another time in another paper, but that's already been shown to be problematic when the lag screw technique, and that's fallen out of favor. And I, don't, I know there are certain parts of the country that still like it, um, but there's been a lot of studies that show that with the lag screw technique, you're torquing the condyle, and that's what causes a lot of the relapse. But in, in short, this new 2019 meta-analysis shows that a lot of the problematic procedures mentioned in the profit and turvy hierarchy have been resolved with better fixation and better techniques. And to this day, the only truly problematic procedures would be widening of the maxilla or re re using resorbable plates or doing a mandibular rotation with lag screws. But pretty much everything else is in the stable category. And I'll leave you with that, and I'll see you guys next time.